Hi everyone. Okay, let me just. Uh, Hello. Hi everyone. This is Jung Lok. So the first one I want to say is Go Hei Pak Choi. You know, like Happy New Year to everyone. This is the Year of the Tiger. So I hope everyone has a uh, prosperous New Year and also have a very happy and very happy 2022. Uh, this is the fifth day of the New Year of the Tiger, and um. My son went to Epcot Center in Disney uh, and bought me this. This is Bong Hei Ba Choi and Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse are saying Happy New Year to everyone. So this is my uh, little uh, New Year thing that I did this year. I actually haven't done much of anything. Um, everybody knows that this is like um, the third year of the, of the uh, COVID pandemic and we are still um, trying to recover, we have some up and downs. We we thought we'll be okay, and then we have a different variant, and we thought we'll be okay, and then uh, a stronger variant we discover. But then you know, like we continue to overcome it, and hopefully everybody will have healthy and strong 2022. And um, I think that a lot of us are you know continuously adjusting to see uh, whether we can. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm meeting people as I go along. So if I stop a little bit, you know, like, um, uh, bear with me, okay. But welcome Noreen and welcome uh, Melanie and uh, Julie. And today we actually have uh, more people, so which is great. And as I say, Happy New Year. So I do have a lot of questions that I want to answer. So um, let me just make a list of them. And I also still want to keep this to around 40 minutes. So if I don't answer all the questions, I will probably leave it for the next one. And one more thing, you know, um, before I, um, um, before, I mean, actually, when I started this, um, this is a monthly thing. And then after I did it for um, probably around one and a half year or so, what I find out is that um, the, uh, the attendance kind of drooped off. So I, um, talk to the artists who are participating and then we decided to do it every other month. And so I did that, but then, you know, like I also have requests to get it back to a month. So um, at the end of this, when I send the um, recording link, if you can give me a quick answer as to whether you want it to be a monthly thing or you want to keep it as every other month, because I don't want you to be too busy only attending your own stuff. But then sometimes, you know, would you have a, dying questions that you don't want me to answer on the, um, on the email, you want to like share the answer with everyone. Um, you know, it weeks a long time to wait. So, so uh, you know, let me know um, how, you know, how you want the frequency. So let me get to some of the things that we are going to talk about. So I have, from my last one, I talked about two kinds of copying for calligraphy. So what I'm going to do is I, um, I'm going to uh, show you how we really do two kinds of copying in calligraphy. And I also said that I will bring some sample of stone rubbing. So I did you know, bring some of the calligraphy book that is from stone rubbing. And then um, when we have time, we'll talk about the difference between Lotus and Magnolia. Um, I do have um, a student that um, said that one of her teachers actually told her that, you know, like um, when she want to learn to paint magnolia, she just paint a lotus and draw it on a tree. <laughs> so, so I want to do a little bit of, you know, difference and similarity of the two flowers. There's some truth to it, but then there's also where we think that you have to know, you know, you, you really don't want to look like you drew a lotus, put some branches on it and make it a magnolia. Um, and then um, um, I also want to, you know, we have time, um, talk a little bit about the really exciting uh, VR gallery that we have uh, scheduled on the 19th of this month. And um, I was just talking with some of the organizer, uh, the lady that built the VR gallery yesterday. And um, if I can, if you want to have your avatar in the VR space, I'll give you a link to build your own avatar. So, you know, little things like that. I know that some of you just want to wander in, but some of you really want to have your own avatar walking in that look like you and things like that. So, so we're going to talk about that. And then I do have addi additional question that I got um, since I shared the email and uh, the difference between Western watercolor paint and um, 
whether there's any particular additives to it um, in order to use it for sumier, and also uh, a question about wet mounting and also, uh, you know, like supply store. So we'll see how many we can get to. All right, uh, let me just change the um, screen because what I, what, okay, actually, let, let me just talk a little bit about this. Um, All right, anybody can see that? Closer. All right. Oops. Okay. All right, so um, I talk about two kinds of uh, learning calligraphy. And what I did is I actually pick up some of the little books that these are books that kids in uh, Hong Kong would use. This is something that you can buy in the stationery store. It's just like um, when we are learning how to write, we will, um, you know, like for example, when we're in kindergarten, we'll have a book that, and actually would we'll say, you know, like this is A, and then we will have dotted line, and then we will actually draw the A, and then we'll do a whole line of A, B, C, like that, right? This is how we learn penmanship when we were in kindergarten and maybe first grade. So in Hong Kong, and I'm sure that in uh, Asian countries that practice Chinese calligraphy, what they would do is they would have something, you know, like if it's not this exact book, it would be something similar. And if you take a closer look, it would actually say this is for fourth grade, this is for sixth grade, and this is for fifth grade. So they actually have a progression. So what it did is, is similar to that. And when you open it, it has, you know, like pictograph of a uh, picture of, you know, how you should sit, you should not lean on it, you should sit up straight. This is how you should hold the brush. and this is actually the works that um, you want kids to practice. And notice that there are two kinds of grid. This one is um, in Western world, we call it like a tic-tac-toe, which is basically nine square, right? There is also another one that is in Western world, we call it the union jack, but basically what it looks like is, is this design, okay? And of course, in Western world, we call it the Union Jack. And in, in Chinese word, we call it the rice pattern because the word rice um, looks very much like this. So it's the Union Jack. But basically, whether this is the tic-tac-toe or the Union Jack, what it is, it, it also, the grid would help you how to copy the words, right? So, you know, I think you can, I mean, I think you can still see it, yeah. So, so two kind of copying. And you will see that there are little dotted lines here. The reason is when the kids are doing this, what they did is they use a pair of scissors and then they will cut this out, right? Because the book that they are going to work on, the penmanship, come in papers that look like this. This is actually a raw piece of um, penmanship paper or calligraphy paper. And depends on what store you get it from. This one is this, like this, but then maybe you can also find some that that a different grid look like this. But then these are both the tic tac uh, the tic tac toe grid, and you will also have some of the ones that, for example, you can practice calligraphy on this that the water will dry. But this is all the tic tac toe grid. So what you do with that, you actually um, do your calligraphy on it, and this is how you fold a paper. And sometimes they can fold it, but basically you fold it in half and you fold it in half again. This is the classic way of what a um, Chinese book would look like in the olden time. So what happened is this is rice paper. And, and then I bought this because this is actually a calligraphy book by one of my very dear friends who is a calligrapher. But then this is how you put all this paper together with a flat and then they will be kind of sewed together, right? So, um, so what is the 
trick of this. The trick of this is each page is actually kind of double side. And by being double side, you actually have a hollow here. So what you do is whatever you cut out from the book, say, you know, for example, you know, I cut this out and then, you know, because I don't want to cut this, so it becomes this. So the so the, the the student would do this. They will actually slide this on between the page. And, and then with a calligraphy pen, they will actually copy this. Okay, this is the first kind of copy. In Cantonese, it's called Hmong. Okay, so two kinds of copying. This is Hmong, which is actually like tracing. You are really tracing the word. The word is, the papers is on top of the original and you are tracing, right? So that's the first kind of copying. The second kind of copying is called lam. okay? China has all this different terminology for each different thing. So when it's come to English, it's still called copying, but then this kind of copying is not mong. Mong is tracing. And then this is lam. Lam means that you put it side by side and by putting it side by side, you look at the word and then you, because of the grid, you know that you start here and then go to go across the second square to the top of this square, but end right here. So, so you basically copy by looking on it. Okay, so that is two kinds of copying. So any questions on that? Is this clear? So what, what usually people do is when you were younger, you will put the, everybody does this, you know, like do that when we were in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and things like that. But then when you, you know, are older, when you are four, third grade, fourth grade, actually the teacher would want you to be copying like this, right? And then of course, you know, when you, um, when you advance, so you will continue to copy because there are tons and tons of good calligraphy. And I'm sure that if you are into calligraphy, you will know that um, this is what we do um, on communication and this is the standard script. So people can read it. Um, most people learn the center script, but then there are a lot of different kinds of script. And um, so there are different kinds of books. I, I, this is only a tip of the iceberg, but, but I have a lot of different kinds of books on different style of calligraphy. So it depends on what kind do you want. For example, some of them, this is like the seal script. So you will see it in a lot of different seal but you see the style is completely different. Then for example, um, for example, this. Okay. Right. So, okay. so, so this is another style. So well, after you finish copying on the center script, if you are into calligraphy, your teacher will actually pick a particular um, sample of a master calligrapher and ask you to follow that particular style. And then even in the center script, there are multiple master and they have a slight difference in their personal style. Um, two of the really famous one, this is called Ao Yangsheng and this is called An Zhenheng. These are, these are some of their, you know, like really classic uh, sample calligraphy. And if you take a closer look, you notice that they are all kind of black with white words. So now that come to the second um, question I want to answer is about stone rubbing. Um, these individuals, for example, uh, An Zhenheng, okay? An Zhenheng was in the Tang Dynasty. And Tang Dynasty is really, really a long time ago. And then um, how would we be able to um, know how his calligraphy look like, right? So um, in order to preserve it, of course there are multiple ways, but 
one of the really classic way that we'll find good calligraphy from Asian masters, actually from stone rubbing. And um, I look in my collection of travel book and I um, have this book on the um, Yangtze River. And then in the Yangtze River, there are lots of different clips on both sides. And what we'll see is, if you travel to China, you'll know that sometimes on some clips, they have some really big words in, in really good calligraphy that is carved onto the side of the wall of, of the clip. And this one is big, so you can see, but then there are some small ones that, you know, like the picture is not showing very clearly, but but they are actually words around here and also words around here and they are all in on the clips. And sometimes they, um, on some really famous um, location, scenic um, places, where there's a cliff with relatively smooth wall, what people would do is they will actually smoothen it more and then they will put an entire article, poem, or, um, you know, various, uh, statement and document onto it. I think you probably remember the um, really famous um, movie from China called Red Cliff a few years ago. And then Red, Red Cliff is a historic story, although, you know, the Hollywood version, some of the detail of the story changed, but then uh, the people in Red Cliff, the, the, um, the free kingdoms, I mean, those are actually part of Chinese history. And Red Cliff is a place that exists. And there's a very long article, a famous document about the story of Radcliffe. And this one, as I said, this is the Yancy River Travel book, but I'm not sure where you can see, but this is a big wall. And on the wall, there's actually an entire piece of article craft into the wall. So you can imagine how people get this sample from Ao Yangsheng or this really beautiful calligraphy from An Zhanheng, they are from stone rubbing. And not only on clips, sometimes, um, for example, um, if you go to the Lincoln Memorial, and um, of course you have the Lincoln statue in the middle, but then on the wall of the memorial, there will be various article or passages or statements engraved onto the wall. And this is the same thing, you know, um, sometimes when some, you know, like famous people pass away or some, you know, like emperors or important merchants or usually rich people, you know, like merchants or, you know, important people passed away, they would commission um, a person to write an article about their life. And then they will commission a calligrapher to actually, you know, write, put that article into good calligraphy and then they will ask a craftsman to engrave that article in the perfect calligraphy onto the tomb of that person. And then the tomb is, as I say, usually it's a rich person or a, uh, a monarch. So they would have a long article and some of these famous stone rubbings are of um, people who have passed away that the article is about their life or about particular incidents. And that's, those are the stone rubbing, right? So why is it this way? Because when you think about it, it's just like your seal. When you craft the calligraphy onto the stone, the calligraphy itself is the one that is chipped away. So when you do a stone rubbing, you put ink onto the entire stone and you put a paper on top to rub on it. So calligraphy is white because it's the one that is chipped away and the stone is the black portion where the ink can hit the rock. The stone surface is the surface. And therefore, occasionally for really, really antique stone rubbing, um, let's see, um, antique stone rubbing, for example, okay, in this particular one, probably the this particular portion was chipped away and two things would happen. If it's chipped away, sometimes we'll have to leave it that way because we don't want to further and then uh, endanger and damage the stone. So we'll leave it that way. But sometimes people will actually fix it. And hopefully they are not fixing the stone, right? So what they will do is they will have the stone rubbing 
and then they will from the stone rubbing try to you know kind of like kind of like extend the line to see what the word would really be for example like you this you see these two words these two words obviously the stone rubbing for some reason some of them has chipped away so what we will do is we will kind of you know like have to identify what this word is i mean what is chipped away is it a line or is it you know because when we read the with this particular word, this word means the world um, or a border. So you know that this on the top, you know, like the word should be you know, like this and then yeah. a horizontal line and a vertical wow. line. And, and so you will fix it. So this is what a stone rubbing would look like. So any questions on the calligraphy learning and also the stone rubbing before I go to the next topic because we do have a lot to cover today. Any questions? No? All right. So let me see what is my third topic to cover. Okay, the first topic I want to cover is actually the um, difference between um, Lotus and Magnolia. Okay. I have, they are not in season right now um, because it's, we are still in the middle of winter, but then uh, I do have pretty uh, convincing silk flowers and this is a Lotus. Of course, you know, they, they have, may have different species, but this is a typical lotus, right? And then I also have a pretty good sample of a uh, southern magnolia. Magnolia has also different species. So um, I'm not talking about the one that is more reddish and purplish. In Washington, D.C., you know, also along, along Maryland, uh, a lot of the, um, the magnolia, which we call um, Sunyi would, I mean, can be found. And I'm not talking about that one. This one is what we call Moklan or Yoklan. Is, is um, in, in America, we call it Southern Magnolia. This one is the one that probably the teacher of um, Judith is talking about uh, why it looks like it. Because first of all, you see the shape, the size is similar. And then the shape, the general shape is similar, is in a bowl shape, okay? Because some flower is in a disc shape, some flower uh, in, you know, for example, a, a um, iris um, would be different. Okay. Um, so here, so they're both in a bowl shape, okay? And then also you notice the petal is kind of similar as well, all right? Um, but then what is the difference? So let me just, um, uh, let me ask people to mute themselves. Let me see if I can mute you. Uh, uh, I think someone needs to mute themselves. Let me see. Okay, we're back. All right. Thank you for muting. And um, what we talk about is the magnolia and um, lotus. Okay. As I say, the general shape is the same. And um, as a matter of fact, they are so similar. One of the reasons that uh, I put them together because they are similar. In my book called um, Chinese Brush Painting Flowers, which I know a lot of you have, um, let's just go to the share screen. You can see better. Okay. Is it in focus? No, okay. I think it's focus, right? <laughs> okay, in my um, brush painting book, Flowers, and you probably notice that what I did is I actually put them together. I have the Southern Magnolia, and then after it, it's followed by the, uh, the one that we find in DC, which is also called Magnolia, it's called the Mulan, because this is Yoklan, this is Moklan or Sanyi, right? And then, after that, I have two lotus, one with the outline and one with the um, uh, bonus stroke. But they are, these four flowers are all together because when I, when I arrange how to put this um, book together, I actually, you know, like I, I have various ways. I can group them by shape. I can group them by seasons. I can group them by alphabetical order and things like that. And um, after some, debating, I think that, you know, some people may want to go from 
the beginning of the book to the end of the book. So I actually did it in more like simple to difficult, but I also want people to kind of progress from one thing to another. And therefore, you know, the, the magnolia, the soft magnolia, the Mulan magnolia, and also the Lotus two style are all together in one batch. Um, so this is the soft magnolia, this one, right? And then the Lotus is here and also here. Okay. By the way, um, I can talk a little bit about this as well. I do not have a silk flower on this to show and uh, they are not in season yet. Um, but then um, the reason why I don't have a silk flower is because I actually have one in my garden. I can, I can find them you know, when they're in season all the time and they are uh, all over Washington DC and Virginia and Maryland as well. So here. Uh, the lotus, right? just a very simple one. Okay. As I shape, both of them has a bow shape, but when you do a lotus, let's, let's just do a simple one. Okay, so, so this is a basically a lotus, all right? And then of course, if it is above the water and the inside, this one is blocking it, you don't see it. So it's around this. So this is basically a lotus. If you want to flip some of the um, leaves, I mean, or some of the petals, then you can, for example, uh, as I said, this one has flipped. So you can do a little bit of you know, variety. something like that, right? Uh, how about a magnolia? Okay, the softer magnolia. The edge of the flower has more movement, okay? It has more kind of like um, wrinkle. So when I'm drawing that, a lot of times I, will make it more interesting, for example. And then of course, the inside is different too. And that would be the magnolia, the softened magnolia, right? And um, I talk about the sun yifa, which is the one that is kind of like the purplish one. The purplish one, the um, petal is slightly different. The petal is more thicker on the top and narrower on the bottom like this. So I don't think I have um, a how-to on the uh, drawing inside the book, but then um, if you pay attention, you'll know that um, the cover is that magnolia that, you know, like the, the petal is kind of more rounder on the top, but has a narrow, um, narrower, two going down more so than this. This one is more like a bow. This one is more like a, um, a trumpet, right? So that is the, um, the, the magnolia, right? So, so that's the difference. And of course, you know, like um, when it comes to the magnolia, they should not be on the same branch, but what the heck, right? It will be like this, okay? And then, this kind, the flower come before the leaves. So usually when the flower are blooming, you don't have leaves. While this one, the flower and the leaves come together. So you have the flower and the leaf as well, all right? So those are, you know, like some of the differences of the um, lotus and the magnolia. Any questions on that? I have a uh, workshop on the lotus already. 
And I did a workshop on painting the cover. So, so I did talk a little bit about this. Um, I'm not sure whether people will be interested, but I can, I can do a workshop on the Southern Magnolia. Um, this is not as commonly found in Sumie painting, but then, you know, like, um, but it's, it's really beautiful. And, uh, um, and then the, the thing is, you know, it has really showy leaves as well. And uh, you see this in a lot in um, silk, uh, what, silk life arrangement of Western painting, especially uh, oil and acrylic ones. So um, I haven't seen much in uh, Sumie painting, but then, you know, when people are interested, I can, I can do a Zoom workshop on that because uh, it's kind of fun to do the, um, to do the, the edges as well. And um, especially it's white on white. Um, I, I have my favorite green to use to, to do the layers. So which, which could be something that people might be interested. Anybody interested? Not sure, you know, you can, you can raise your hand or, or you know, like email me and um, uh, things like that because I continuously look for um, good subjects to, to cover in the um, upcoming workshops and things like that. So um, let me see. Uh, right. So um, then uh, I have to, um, okay, according to my program, you know, this is the one that we uh, ask people, um, do you have any new year painting to share? Because this is kind of like our new year gathering as well. Last year we did an episode just on that, but then um, uh, this year, because I know everybody is busy and I, I, I know that we, people will feel the pressure of not being able to um, uh, paint something and then show off. So, so I uh, didn't, didn't make it like a show and tell this time, but then I want to give people an opportunity if they have any particular painting to share for to wishing everyone happy new year, you know, like raise your hand and say something. Okay, yes, Debbie. Well, my, my stepson oh, gave me some silk for Christmas and it was raw silk. And I followed one of your online videos for landscape and I was just playing around with painting on silk. And this is how that turned out. It, it was really difficult when it came to doing washes and layers because no matter how hard you try, the ink will still run. It won't dry like it does on rice paper. So you can't spray the whole thing and then apply a wash. But it's been a lot of fun to try to, to paint on silk, <laughs> especially yeah, the, the nutty stuff. Uh-huh. Yes, the um the silk, uh, I mean, like, how should I put this? Uh, in order for the fabric to accept the moisture without running. They, mm -hmm. they have the tendency to react like size rice paper. Um, you know, like um, you guys may not know, but then when, when Debbie got the silk from, from her son-in-law, she actually emailed me on some of the tips of, you know, painting on silk. And I did, we did talk about that, you know, like it, it has the kind of like, you know, not exactly, but it has a similar quality as size paper because of the, the, the treatment that the silk has to receive. Um, in order to be able to do that. Because if you just go to a fabric store and buy a piece of, you know, whatever material and then just use the paint on it, it will, it will run. I mean, the, 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 um, the effect is not the same. So in order for it to be um, artist material as a surface, um, there are, there are some treatment that is needed. And then um, another thing is, you know, like I, I think I saw, you know, like Debbie did that too. But then usually what we do is almost like mountain, you, you actually have to scratch it onto a frame to make sure that the the, the fabric doesn't doesn't like uh, crumble together into a mesh when when you are painting. So so there are different treatments. And um, mm -hmm. I have a friend who is really into doing gongbi fine line flowers on silk. Um, I haven't seen her work in a long time. I think she probably retired from painting. But um, but then um, it's so meticulous. But then the effect is so beautiful, especially the same thing as rice paper. You can paint on the front and back of silk, just like you paint on the front and back of rice paper. And um, her flowers also have that special effect of painting the front and back of the flower. So oh. it's, it's, it's outrageously beautiful. But I also saw that the silk that you use is probably thicker than, mm. than the one that, um, that um, sometimes people buy from um, various supply store. They do have that and 
a lot of times the silk that came from the art, um, art store, they usually have a tint on it. Instead of pure white, they usually have a, a tan color on it because um, uh -huh. so by doing that, then white would show very nicely too. So, mm -hmm. so that is that is beautiful. And I recognize that that uh, that is from the like Como. <laughs> right. <laughs> I know right. it's, it's so scary, you know, like um uh um Sumi did not really um I mean a, a lot of Sumi uh, uh competition did not have that you know like really strict rule but then for example in watercolor societies you definitely cannot copy anybody's composition or artwork right. to enter a show right. right it will be you know fully disqualified and I have right. to say that you know sometimes people wonder why would people know and I'm like if it is your work you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, like because if you if you if you um, you know, like uh, we solve all the design and you know, like composition and color choice problem, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and when you say it, you're like, oh, that's mine. <laughs> yeah, well, when it's about the material and just trying to figure things out, I'd rather follow your video and then just get the feel for it, and then I can go on to some original things. But yeah, yeah, no, no, no it's as an exercise, it's good. Yeah. Right, right. It's beautiful too, by the way. And anyone Thanks. have any any artwork to share? I know everybody is very busy, uh, and um, so what I'm going to do is uh, I am going to talk about um, the web event on the 19th before we end because I I still want to keep our time frame. Um, the web event um, I know that I have sent the first email I sent. The first, the first email that I sent, um, I already received like 25 plus reply that some people really show an interest to come. And yes, you can bring your family member and things like that, with, uh, but make sure that it's the same computer because uh, one of the things that we are afraid of is that the VR gallery, because it's VR and everybody go in, um, I think is the memory or the, um, you know, like um, whatever power we have to run, it cannot take, more than a certain number of people. We do not, I actually talked to the, um, the, the, um, the person who built it yesterday. Um, she is not certain. She believed that it can hold 50, but she's not sure. And she doesn't want to have crashed it and then find out it's 50 or, or 49 or 39 or things like that. So, so I do not know how many people would be, but then um, I don't think we will crush it. <laughs> but, but then, um, you know, like, uh, uh, we, 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 we'll play by the year. And um, if you have never entered a VR gallery or if you enter a VR space, you can create your own avatar. And I will write it down on the email um, when I share this to you because this one will be on YouTube. But then there's a, um, there's a, uh, a website that you can build your own avatar for free. You don't have to sign up. You don't have to set up a password. You just, um, you just go in and then you can build an avatar. When I see you build an avatar, you can, uh, you can make yourself look like a cat <laughs> or, or you can have someone that, you know, for example, I wear glasses. So my avatar will also wear glasses. So, so and black hair. So, so when you see some black hair with glasses, you'll recognize, oh, that's probably your own you know, or something like that. So if you want to build your own avatar uh, for that. And then um, another thing is um, with, with you do not have a mouse, or with you, or with your keyboard doesn't have the move arrow that go up, down, left, right, because that's how you move around in the VR gallery. You walk into the VR gallery and you can, as if you are walking inside. If you do not have the key, and I have already sent, you know, like what is forward, what is backward, but then a easier way is when you look at your keyboard, if you're looking at your own keyboard right now, just go to the upper left corner and you will see Q, W, E on the first line, A, S, D on the second line, right? I mean, this is a standard keyboard. So every one keyboard is the same. So just remember those six um, keys and just imagine them as arrow. And that's why W is going up or forward, S is going down. And then A is turned to the left and D is turned to the right. So you don't have to remember it. I mean, you look at the keyboard, okay? And then the word Q and the word E is to turn, kind of like instead of walking, you just turn to the left, turn to the right. And that turning to the left is Q, turning to the right is E. So those are the six keys that is on the upper left part of the keyboard. 
I'll explain that again when we're in the VR gallery. So if you want to build your avatar, I'll send you a link. Uh, with you uh, do not have a mouse, those are the key that you can move around. But of course, if you have a mouse, you can just use the mouse. And uh, with your keyboard has the arrow key that go up, down, left, right. You can just touch that up, 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 up key to, to continue walking forward with not just www, okay? So um, any questions on the VR gallery? Okay, I, I, um, I have built a PowerPoint to explain the artwork. So I think it should be fun to join. Um, and if you have not been to a VR gallery, it's kind of fun. And I am not aware of, at least, you know, like in my small amount of uh, uh, knowledge that I know, I'm not aware of any Sume artwork in a VR gallery before. So this one may be a first one. And this one may be a first one that we have a talk on Sume work in a VR gallery. So, so you know, like, uh, Hey, you know, like you, you want to be like, I'm the first guest in that VR experience. And I don't know, I know it can be recorded, the tool into the VR gallery, but I haven't found out how yet, but I'm sure that, you know, between now and the 19th, you know, if I figure it out, I will do that. And um, so I'm coming close to my uh, 40 minutes. And in the next one, I will answer some of the questions that um, people have asked me. Um, for the next one, uh, the difference between different kind of watercolor, uh, the things about mounting, and on the supplies, I would just send it in. Uh, I send in the name of uh, Manin Zhong, which is uh, the one I use uh, to buy supply from Hong Kong. So, any additional questions before we close for today's chat? Okay. Oh, by the way, I mute you guys. So, so if you want to say something, you have to unmute yourself. So any, any questions? Yeah. So, so a quick uh, survey, do you want this? Uh, do, I, do you want me to go back to monthly again or you want to like do every other month? Monthly. Want to go back to monthly? Okay. Because what I noticed is um, uh, uh, I, I do have new, um, uh, newer students that sign up. Okay. Okay, how do you mark a silk painting? Um, I myself do not do it, but then when my, um, when my friend who is into doing the silk painting, um, what she did is she actually has already have the silk mounted on a frame before she paint. So after she finished painting, the whole frame is mounted. Um, I, will, I will see if I can make a make a sample and I can um, show you next time. Just like when I, when I say, you know, like different two kinds of copying uh, calligraphy. I mean, uh, last time I talked about it, but then talking is not hard to imagine, but then this time I actually bring in the, the paper and bring in the things and then you understand more. So, so next time I, um, I, will, I will make a, a frame that looks like what she used, but basically uh, you mount the whole thing, the, the, the frame and the silk that, that when she was creating it, she, she never take it out. The whole frame is mounted just like a, a painting. And then Debbie, um, you know, like I saw that your, your silk painting is actually on its own. So do you have any particular idea of how to mount that or, or you have a different way? Well, since I'm not using it for, for any kind of display, it's just for me. Oh. I was just going to um, use spray adhesive and just put it on a piece of foam core oh. or, or heavy mounting paper and just, you know, just mat it maybe, but it's not going in a frame for any display. Yeah, let me, let me see, because I mean, I do have the material, you know, as I say, I have, you know, our supplies to last a lifetime. Sometimes, you know, like when you see something and you're like, oh, that is so curious, you know, like I just bought it. So I think I have the material somewhere in my, in my uh, studio. Um, as I say, I do not really practice um, painting on silk. It's, a, it's just like going be painting. I mean, I can do it, but then I enjoy the freehand so much more that majority of my painting are the freehand Nan style. But then, you know, like if I kind of like get inspired, I want to do a gong fine line painting, um, I can do it. So um, 
um, I do have the material for that. Let me let me see if I can put that together. So in the next one, we'll talk about the um, different kind of watercolor, different kind of mounting, uh, silk mounting, and and um, also I have a question on dry mounting. Um, I myself do not do not really do the dry mounting. So um, and I like to give it to a professional because uh, with the um, small, short amount of time that I have for art, I'd rather be painting. <laughs> But I'm not sure about, you know, like uh, some people may want to do everything themselves. So we'll see what we can share. But then um, I may not have a lot of information on the dry mountain because it's not something that I do. Um, I know that uh, there has been multiple development on mountain, especially the newer material that you can use an iron and just iron something in. Um, just just almost like um, when if you are into sewing, um, if you add, a, if you want to strengthen a piece of cloth for the collar or for uh, seams, sometimes, you know, in the olden times, you have to really use some phase and glue and do a lot of different things. But nowadays, you know, the, the phasing is already glued. You can just bring to the iron and iron it, and then the phasing will be onto the, um, the, the fabric. And um, something similar to the phasing has been developed for mounting Sumi painting. I have not done it, uh, but I know that that material and those choices are available for artists. So, um, any last word? Um, okay, I have a question on, is there a calligraphy book to practice with English translation in addition to Chinese characters? Um, that I am not sure they exist, because uh, English translation of Chinese word, majority of time is based on phonetics when it comes to names. Because you probably think about names, right? When it comes to names, we usually transfer by phonetics instead of meaning. Um, for example, with, with a person's name is um, Sakura, you know, like meaning cherry blossom. Um, we would actually tr um, not, not translate the person and call the person cherry. Awesome, but will actually, you know, like Sakura, you know, or or whatever that language coming. Like for example, Helen would be Hoi Lun. And Hoi Lun, you know, like there's no particular meaning, but the word Hoi means see. Um, you know, so so uh, the translation of Chinese word and is is not as um, easy to have a dictionary. I'm sure that maybe some of these exist, but then most of them are phonetics. And because it's phonetics, um, it's also one word can have different sounds. So, uh, you know, for example, um, as I say, Mary, you know, like there are certain translation, but the word mare and the word we, the sound can be different words that have the same sound. So um, it's not a given that a particular word would be used because some people like to play with the number of strokes, some people like to play with um, what the word means for that. As a matter of fact, um, especially for very famous brand get translated into Asian language in order for marketing, um, they usually hire a professional to do it. I remember the, um, of course the, the hotel chain Sheraton, when they want to come to Asia, um, they, they have a naming contest to transfer to translate the word Sheraton into Chinese, and um, the winner is um, I, I have to say it's really clever. Um, Sheraton's Chinese name is Hei Loi Dang, and Hei Loi Dang means I'm so happy you arrive. Hei is happy or pleasure. Loi is when you arrive. Um, so so Hei Loi Dang become I'm so happy you arrive. And it's the name of a hotel. I mean, how fitting it is, you know. So, so you know, it's not just the word, but then the phonetics and the sound, and also how it's kind of like it's an art form on itself. So I don't think there is any particular books on that. Um, but then, you know, like new ones are being written every day, so maybe those are there. But anyway, um, I will let everybody go. I will uh, finish up this video and post it on YouTube. And in the next one, I will answer, continue to answer the questions that we will have. And um, from, the, um, from the response, um, 
I will have that in March. And also uh, hope to see you for the uh, VR gallery tour and also that. But thank you, everybody. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, thank you, John.